chapter 17, Hoshea of Israel. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, son of Elah, became king of Israel. He ruled in Samaria for nine years. As far as God was concerned, he lived a bad life, but not nearly as bad as the kings who had preceded him. Then, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, attacked. Hoshea was already a puppet of the Assyrian king and regularly sent him tribute. But Shalmaneser discovered that Hoshea had been operating traitorously behind his back, having worked out a deal with King So of Egypt. And, adding insult to injury, Hoshea was way behind on his annual payments of tribute to Assyria. So the king of Assyria arrested him and threw him in prison, then proceeded to invade the entire country. He attacked Samaria and threw up a siege against it. The siege lasted three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea's reign, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and took the people into exile in Assyria. He relocated them in Hala, in Gozan, along the Habor River, and in the towns of the Medes. The exile came about because of sin. The children of Israel sinned against God, their God, who had delivered them from Egypt and the brutal oppression of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They took up with other gods, fell in with the ways of life of the pagan nations God had chased off, and went along with whatever their kings did. They did all kinds of things on the sly, things offensive to their God. Then, openly and shamelessly built local sex and religion shrines at every available site. They set up their sex and religion symbols at practically every crossroads. Everywhere you looked, there was smoke from their pagan offerings to the deities. The identical offerings that had gotten the pagan nations off into exile. They had accumulated a long list of evil actions. And God was fed up. Fed up with their persistent worship of gods carved out of dead wood or shaped out of clay. Even though God had plainly said, don't do this, ever. God had taken a stand against Israel and Judah, speaking clearly through countless holy prophets and seers time and time again. Turn away from your evil way of life. Do what I tell you and have been telling you in the revelation I gave your ancestors, and of which I've kept reminding you ever since through my servants, the prophets. But they wouldn't listen. If anything, they were even more bullheaded than their stubborn ancestors, if that's possible. They were contemptuous of his instructions, the solemn and holy covenant he had made with their ancestors, and of his repeated reminders and warnings. They lived a nothing life and became nothings, just like the pagan peoples all around them. They were well warned. God said don't, but they did it anyway. They threw out everything God, their God, had told them, and replaced him with two statue gods shaped like bull calves, and then a phallic pole for the whore goddess Asherah. They worshipped cosmic forces, sky gods and goddesses, and frequented the sex and religion shrines of Baal. They even sank so low as to offer their own sons and daughters as sacrificial burnt offerings. They indulged in all the black arts of magic and sorcery. In short, they prostituted themselves to every kind of evil available to them. And God had had enough. God was so thoroughly angry that he got rid of them, got them out of the country for good, until only one tribe was left, Judah. Judah actually wasn't much better, for Judah also failed to keep God's commands, falling into the same way of life that Israel had adopted. God rejected everyone connected with Israel, made life hard for them, and permitted anyone with a mind to exploit them to do so. And then, this final no, as he threw them out of his sight. Back at the time that God ripped Israel out of their place in the family of David, they had made Jeroboam, son of Nebat, king. Jeroboam debauched Israel, turned them away from serving God, and led them into a life of total sin. The children of Israel went along with all the sins that Jeroboam did, never murmured so much as a word of protest. In the end, God spoke a final no to Israel and turned his back on them. He had given them fair warning and plenty of time through the preaching of all his servants, the prophets. Then, he exiled Israel from her land to Assyria. And that's where they are now. The king of Assyria brought in people from Babylon, Cutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvaim, and relocated them in the towns of Samaria, replacing the exiled Israelites. They moved in as if they owned the place, and made themselves at home. When the Assyrians first moved in, 
God was just another God to them. They neither honored nor worshipped him. Then God sent lions among them, and people were mauled and killed. This message was then sent back to the king of Assyria. The people you brought in to occupy the towns of Samaria don't know what's expected of them from the God of the land. And now he sent lions, and they're killing people right and left because nobody knows what the God of the land expects of them. The king of Assyria ordered, Send back some priests who were taken into exile from there. They can go back and live there and instruct the people in what the God of the land expects of them. One of the priests who had been exiled from Samaria came back and moved into Bethel. He taught them how to honor and worship God. But each people that Assyria had settled went ahead anyway, making its own gods and setting them up in the neighborhood sex and religion shrines that the citizens of Samaria had left behind, a local custom-made god for each people. For Babylon, Succoth Benoth, for Cutha, Nergo, for Hamath, Ashima, for Ava, Nibaz and Tartak, for Sepharvaim, Adrimelech, and Anemelech. People burned their children in sacrificial offerings to these gods. They honored and worshipped God, but not exclusively. They also appointed all sorts of priests, regardless of qualification, to conduct a variety of rites at the local fertility shrines. They honored and worshipped God, but they also kept up their devotions to the old gods of the places they had come from. And they're still doing it, still worshipping any old god that has nostalgic appeal to them. They don't really worship God. They don't take seriously what he says regarding how to behave and what to believe, what he revealed to the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. God made a covenant with his people and ordered them, don't honor other gods, don't worship them, don't serve them, don't offer sacrifices to them. Worship God, the God who delivered you from Egypt in great and personal power. Reverence and fear him. Worship him, sacrifice to him, and only him. All the things he had written down for you, directing you in what to believe and how to behave. Well, do them for as long as you live. And whatever you do, don't worship other gods. And the covenant he made with you, don't forget your part in that. And don't worship other gods. Worship God and God only. He's the one who will save you from enemy oppression. But they didn't pay attention. They kept doing what they'd always done. As it turned out, all the time these people were putting on a front of worshiping God. They were at the same time involved with their local idols. And they're still doing it. Like father, like son. Chapter 18 Hezekiah of Judah In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, began his rule over Judah. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he ruled for 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. In God's opinion, he was a good king. He kept to the standards of his ancestor, David. He got rid of the local fertility shrines, smashed the phallic stone monuments, and cut down the sex and religion Asherah groves. As a final stroke, he pulverized the ancient bronze serpent that Moses had made. At that time, the Israelites had taken up the practice of sacrificing to it. They had even dignified it with a name, Nehushtan, the old serpent. Hezekiah put his whole trust in the God of Israel. There was no king quite like him, either before or after. He held fast to God, never loosened his grip, and obeyed to the letter everything God had commanded Moses. And God, for his part, held fast to him through all his adventures. He revolted against the king of Assyria. He refused to serve him one more day. And he drove back the Philistines, whether in sentry outposts or fortress cities, all the way to Gaza and its borders. In the fourth year of Hezekiah and the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, attacked Samaria. He threw a siege around it and after three years captured it. It was in the sixth year of Hezekiah and the ninth year of Hoshea that Samaria fell to Assyria. The king of Assyria took Israel into exile and relocated them in Hala, in Gozen on the Habor River, and in towns of the Medes. All this happened because they wouldn't listen to the voice of their God and treated his covenant with careless contempt. They refused either to listen or do a word of what Moses, the servant of God, had commanded. In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, 
Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the outlying fortress cities of Judah and captured them. King Hezekiah sent a message to the king of Assyria at his headquarters in Lachish. I've done wrong, I admit it. Pull back your army, I'll pay whatever tribute you set. The king of Assyria demanded tribute from Hezekiah, king of Judah, 11 tons of silver and a ton of gold. Hezekiah turned over all the silver he could find in the temple of God and in the palace treasuries. Hezekiah even took down the doors of the temple of God and the doorposts that he had overlaid with gold and gave them to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria sent his top three military chiefs, the Tartan, the Ripsaris, and the Ripshakeh, from Lachish with a strong military force to King Hezekiah in Jerusalem. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the laundry commons. They called loudly for the king. Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, who was in charge of the palace, Shebna, the royal secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the court historian, went out to meet them. The third officer, the Rabshakeh, was spokesman. He said, Tell Hezekiah, a message from the great king, the king of Assyria. You're living in a world of make-believe, of pious fantasy. Do you think that mere words are any substitute for military strategy and troops? Now that you've revolted against me, who can you expect to help you? You thought Egypt would, but Egypt's nothing but a paper tiger. One puff of wind and she collapses. Pharaoh king of Egypt is nothing but bluff and bluster. Or are you going to tell me, we rely on God? But Hezekiah has just eliminated most of the people's access to God by getting rid of all of the local God shrines, ordering everyone in Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship at the Jerusalem altar only. So be reasonable. Make a deal with my master, the king of Assyria. I'll give you 2,000 horses if you think you can provide riders for them. You can't do it? Well then, how do you think you're going to turn back even one raw buck private from my master's troops? How long are you going to hold on to that figment of your imagination, these hoped-for Egyptian chariots and horses? Do you think I've come up here to destroy this country without the express approval of God? The fact is that God expressly ordered me, attack and destroy this country. Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please, speak to us in the Aramaic language. We understand Aramaic. Don't speak in Hebrew. Everyone crowded on the city wall can hear you. But the Rabshakeh said, We weren't sent with a private message to your master and you. This is public. A message to everyone within earshot. After all, they're involved in this as well as you. If you don't come to terms, they'll be eating their own turds and drinking their own pee right along with you. Then he stepped forward and spoke in Hebrew loud enough for everyone to hear. Listen carefully to the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Don't let Hezekiah fool you, he can't save you. And don't let Hezekiah give you that line about trusting in God, telling you, God will save us, this city will never be abandoned to the king of Assyria. Don't listen to Hezekiah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Listen to the king of Assyria. Deal with me and live the good life. I'll guarantee everyone your own plot of ground, a garden and a well. I'll take you to a land sweeter by far than this one, a land of grain and wine, bread and vineyards, olive orchards and honey. You only live once, so live, really live. No, don't listen to Hezekiah. Don't listen to his lies, telling you God will save us. Has there ever been a God anywhere who delivered anyone from the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena and Iva? And Samaria, did their gods save them? Can you name a god who saved anyone, anywhere from me, the king of Assyria? So what makes you think that God can save Jerusalem from me? The people were silent. No one spoke a word, for the king had ordered. Don't anyone say a word, not one word. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, and Shebna, the royal secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the court historian, went back to Hezekiah. They had ripped their robes in despair. They reported to Hezekiah the speech of the Rebshakeh. Chapter 19 When Hezekiah heard it all, he too ripped his robes apart and dressed himself in rough burlap. Then he went into the temple of God. He sent Eliakim, who was in charge of the palace, Shebna the secretary, and the senior priests, all of them dressed in rough burlap 
to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They said to him, A message from Hezekiah. This is a black day, a terrible day, doomsday. Babies poised to be born, no strength to birth them. Maybe God, your God, has been listening to the blasphemous speech of the Rabshakeh, who was sent by the king of Assyria, his master, to humiliate the living God. Maybe God, your God, won't let him get by with such talk. And you, maybe you will lift up prayers for what's left of these people. That's the message King Hezekiah's servants delivered to Isaiah. Isaiah answered them, Tell your master, God's word, don't be at all concerned about what you've heard from the king of Assyria's bootlicking errand boys, these outrageous blasphemies. Here's what I'm going to do. Afflict him with self-doubt. He's going to hear a rumor and, frightened for his life, retreat to his own country. Once there, I'll see to it that he gets killed. The Rabshakeh left and found that the king of Assyria had pulled up stakes from Lachish and was now fighting against Libna. Then, Sennacherib heard that Terhaka, king of Cush, was on his way to fight against him. So he sent another envoy with orders to deliver this message to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Don't let that God that you think so much of keep stringing you along with the line, Jerusalem will never fall to the king of Assyria. That's a barefaced lie. You know the track record of the kings of Assyria. Country after country laid waste, devastated. And what makes you think you'll be an exception? Take a good look at these wasted nations, destroyed by my ancestors. Did their gods do them any good? Look at Gozen, Haran, Rezeph, the people of Eden at Tel Asar. Ruins. And what's left of the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of Sepharvaim, of Hina, of Iva? Bones. Hezekiah took the letter from the envoy and read it. He went to the temple of God and spread it out before God. And Hezekiah prayed. Oh, how he prayed. God, God of Israel seated in majesty on the cherubim throne. You are the one and only God, sovereign over all kingdoms on earth, maker of heaven, maker of earth. Open your ears, God, and listen. Open your eyes and look. Look at this letter Sennacherib has sent, a brazen insult to the living God. The facts are true, O God. The kings of Assyria have laid waste countries and kingdoms. Huge bonfires they made of their gods. There are no gods, handmade from wood and stone. But now, O God, our God, save us from raw Assyrian power. Make all the kingdoms on earth know that you are God, the one and only God. It wasn't long before Isaiah, son of Amos, sent word to Hezekiah. God's word, you've prayed to me regarding Sennacherib, king of Assyria. I've heard your prayer. This is my response to him. The virgin daughter of Zion holds you in utter contempt. Daughter Jerusalem thinks you're nothing but scum. Who do you think it is you've insulted? Who do you think you've been badmouthing? Before whom do you suppose you've been strutting? The Holy One of Israel, that's who. You dispatched your errand boys to humiliate the master. You bragged, with my army of chariots, I've climbed the highest mountains, snow-peaked alpine Lebanon mountains. I've cut down its giant cedars, chopped down its prized pine trees. I've traveled the world, visited the finest forest retreats. I've dug wells in faraway places and drunk their exotic waters. I've waded and splashed barefoot in the rivers of Egypt. Did it never occur to you that I'm behind all this? Long. Long ago, I drew up the plans, and now I've gone into action. Using you as a doomsday weapon, reducing proud cities to piles of rubble, leaving their people dispirited, slumped shoulders, limp souls, useless as weeds, fragile as grass, insubstantial as wind-blown chaff. I know when you sit down, when you come, and when you go. And yes, I've marked every one of your temper tantrums against me. It's because of your temper your blasphemous, foul temper, that I'm putting my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth and turning you back to where you came from. And this, Hezekiah, will be for you the confirming sign. This year you'll eat the gleanings. Next year, whatever you can beg, borrow, or steal. But the third year, you'll sow and harvest, plant vineyards and eat grapes. A remnant of the family of Judah yet again will sink down roots and raise up fruit. The remnant will come from Jerusalem, the survivors from Mount Zion. The zeal of God will make it happen. To sum up, this is what God says regarding the king of Assyria. He 
won't enter the city, nor shoot so much as a single arrow there, won't brandish a shield, won't even begin to set siege. He'll go home by the same road he came. He won't enter this city. God's word. I'll shield this city. I'll save this city. For my sake and for David's sake. And it so happened that that very night, an angel of God came and massacred 185,000 Assyrians. When the people of Jerusalem got up next morning, there it was, a whole camp of corpses. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, got out of there fast, headed straight home for Nineveh, and stayed put. One day, when he was worshipping in the temple of his god, Nisroch, his sons, Adramalak and Sherezer, murdered him and then escaped to the land of Ararat. His son, Esar Hadan, became the next king.